Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, today we want to have a look at the um, Mozilla. What in the hell are you doing? How many times do I have to say that? But yes, Mozilla and Facebook have teamed up to develop an advertising platform API. Wow. Great. It's all we need. All we need. Facebook and Mozilla now teaming up. Now, technically, it's meta. We use Facebook for the video description because most people still don't know that Facebook is now called meta, and it includes a cohort of different applications, including Facebook, the metaverse, Instagram, WhatsApp, and a bunch of other things that are all spying on you incessantly. They mostly did this to get around regulation that Instagram data and, and Facebook data would not merge. But if they're all owned by different, they're all separate businesses, of course the parent company can merge them together. So, um, but now we have Mozilla who's been constantly, constantly doing stupid things as of late. And um, now they're teaming up with Facebook, of all people, to do what? Oh, to build what they allege is going to be a privacy-based ad tracking network. Hey, Mozilla, get this through your head. Some of us don't want to be seeing and tracked for ads at all. At all. All right, but let's go ahead and have a look at this. Uh, we did have a digital information world. has a little bit of summary. Mozilla has decided to end its long crusade against Meta and its privacy policies, choosing instead to partner with the company instead. Why? Because they want to help preserve online user safety. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm okay now. Uh, so this author is going through, you know, really liking Mozilla, apparently had a lot of anti-Facebook um, uh, anti stuff, but I guess, I, I bet Meta's like, hey, hey uh, Mozilla, how'd you like some cash? How'd you like some cash? Let's team up. <clears throat> and I was like, all right, all right, man, let's do it. And so they come together to produce this thing called Interoperable Privacy Attribution, or API for short. Or which, uh, excuse me, IPA for short. Very confusing when we're talking about browser APIs. <laughs> I mean, it's like acronym soup. How many people are going to glaze over all this? Be like, I have no idea what's going on. Here's the official Mozilla announcement. Privacy preserving attribution for advertising. Advertising prof uh, pr uh, provides critical support for the web. See, and I agree, okay? It's perfectly fine to have advertising on the web. Do contextual ads, not targeted ads. Okay, here's a thought. If you're following me around the whole internet going like, hey, you want to buy my pen? 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 Eventually you're going to say, what with your damn pen? For crying out loud. But if I'm like, you know, I'm on a website, I'm researching headphone reviews because it's like my, um, you know, I mean, I got I got my, my $4 headphones here from Walmart are going bad. I'm like, man, should I get this time? Maybe the Raycons, maybe some skull candy. And then you start showing me ads for headphones when I'm looking for headphones because I'm on an headphone review ad. Cool, you know? That's okay. I don't mind that as much. I don't mind there is an ad on my website necessarily. As long as it's not in my way and not pushing me malicious stuff and not beeping and plopping and dancing and distracting me all over the place. So I agree that advertising is fine, but the problem is, is we don't want contextual ads. I don't want you to serve an ad that you think, based on data, I want to see. Screw you and your targeted ad. This is why people are running ad blockers. All right. Now, um, we, continuing on, this might be a long video. We have been looking to apply privacy-preserving advertising technology to the attribution problem so that advertisers can get answers to important questions without harming privacy. So privacy is certainly important, but it's not about privacy necessarily. It's about, I don't want to see the same ad over and over and over. In fact, I've told this story many times before. It's worth telling here again. Why I will never, ever, ever in my life buy Amsoil. You guys that make Amsoil, screw you not buying your crap. Why? Well, there was one time uh, 15 or so years, no, better than 10 years ago. I wasn't doing web design 15, I don't think. Yeah, maybe not. Um, but about 10 years ago, I was working on a website for an auto mechanic that also had a side business selling Amsoil. So I had to log into his Amsoil account. 
and grab some ad codes and stuff to put on his website or whatever else. Well, this is before I knew about DuckDuckGo and StartPage. Of course, Google was the only search engine, all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, every since I went there for the, the next two months, all I see on every single website, Amsoil, buy Amsoil, buy Amsoil, buy Amsoil, buy Amsoil, buy Amsoil. Screw Amsoil! Never buying that crap! Never! 15 years! You have hurt me! You have damaged your brand in my eyes. I will not buy your crap because it followed me around the internet forever. It's probably the first thing that caused me to get in there and start deleting all this crap from Google. I think that actually was it. I literally think that was the point in time when I started looking and go, Google collects what? <laughs> Attribution is how advertisers know if their advertising campaigns are working. Well, here's a thought. If you're selling um, headphones and people are buying them, maybe it's working. I don't know. Um, you have other means of collecting such information. Um, I, I know with the one uh, client that I do where we have to use Google ads, um, I can go in and I can see... The um, I can see how many clicks were clicked on and how many times that person landed in the cart. Now, here's the scary part. I can also click the button, see the order number, and go back and see the exact person, their full address and everything about whoever has purchased the product from the Google Ads. That's terrifying. Now, maybe is this solving some of that? Um, actually, no. It doesn't solve any of that. Because if there's a conversion, you can still track that data. Even with all of the privacy APIs you're putting in place, you can still track who has clicked on the ad and purchased it. This doesn't save anything. It's a false facade for privacy where one doesn't exist. For the last few months, we've been working with a team from Meta, formerly Facebook, on a new proposal that aims to enable conversion measurement or attribution for advertising called Interoperable Private Attribution, or, a, or IPA. Wow, I'm going to keep doing that myself. IPA aims to provide advertisers with the ability to perform attribution while providing strong privacy guarantees. It has a two key privacy-preserving features. First, it uses multi-party computation to avoid allowing any single entity uh, websites browsers makers or or advertisers to learn about user behavior but mozilla has some experience with mpc systems for their prio privacy preserving telemetry this is the telemetry that they collect on you second it's an aggregated system which means it produces results that cannot be linked to individual users until of course they click on the thing and purchase the product Together, these features mean the IPA cannot be used to track or profile users. IPA is designed to provide a lot of flexibility for advertising businesses in terms of how they use the system. Cross-device and cross-browser attribution options enable new and more robust attribution capabilities while maintaining privacy. By the way, it also completely removes um, user control. IPA proposal aims to ensure that all sites benefit from these features with a match key concept, which allows smaller players to access the greater reach of entities across device attribution. I'm going to tell you that based on the documentation it provided is BS. This is an entire thing which pushes a global ad network agenda. Say, so, well, that sounds too tinfoil hatty. Mm, no, I'm going to show you the evidence for that in a bit. Together with our co-authors from Meta, by the way, Meta, did they change their address or is it still one hacker way? One hacker way. That's their address. Their street name is called Hacker. Does that tell you something? All right. That's like going and trick-or-treating on Elm Street. You just don't want to do it. It's bad. So... With our co-authors from Meta, we recently proposed IPA to, protect, to the Private Advertising Technology Group, or PATCG. They are a group in the W3C specifically formed on improving advertising without compromising privacy. If you ask me, they should just close down. 
All right. It's promising, but still a work in progress. Blah, blah, blah. Here is their GitHub page. Uh, this is number two. I'm not sure where number one went. I'm guessing if I just kind of come back here, I'll probably find it. Um, one of the factors that tells people most people don't like this, by the way, this is not a lot different from Flock. Um, but a lot of people um, are really against this because people have already gotten into the Google Doc and uh, kind of defaced it a little bit until the uh, the the group had to go back and put a read only copy up. So I downloaded the read only copy, although there are a few edits since I read it. Um, but you can see there's there's a, a number of um, there's a number of of people asking some good questions. Um, uh, let's see if you take a look at the technical uh, proposal, you'll find details. In okay, let's see the uh, question edits. So as suggesting edits to deface. Okay, so where would the match keys be stored? The device, the browser, or the OS? Um, turns out, browser, OS, or app. So your operating system can spy on you. Your app can spy on you. The website can spy on you, and the browser can spy on you. Um, so they have a read-only AI, which browser OS would expose. Um, they do make a lot of references to apps as well. Um, so again, I'm not sure. It's like they're it's like they're playing politics here. They're giving us all the best of it, but if you actually dig into the document, here's the actual document. Um, so it is on Google Docs here. Um, I'm not logged into Google, um, but um, this is Google Docs. Let me see, 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 see proof logged out, proof logged out. <laughs> Um, but this is uh, available. It is published almost a month ago, but the press release from Mozilla was just last week. So yeah, they've been working behind the scenes. Look at this. We got we got two strong arms from from Meta and one guy from Mozilla. And this is just mean. One of them is Ben Savage. I wonder if that's uh, I wonder if that's actually. Um, um, Fred Savage's younger brother, whose name is Ben, Ben Savage, if at last I knew. Um, so I wonder, does, does he work? Any, any, any sleuths out there? Is that, is that the same kid? Is that the same kid we saw in Little Monsters? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's look into the document itself. Um, so this is how the, the system works. And uh, looking into it, in designing a uh, IPA, we set out to find a win-win-win solution for cross-platform attribution. Uh, it's a win-win-win. No, no, no. It's a it's a it's a win-win-lose-lose-lose-lose-lose-lose-lose. Actually, um, maybe I just have Facebook derangement syndrome. That's also possible. And so I'm okay. I'm, I'm self-diagnosed. Um, was that in uh, F FDS? I have FDS. All right. Uh, privacy goal is to limit the total amount of information released about an individual over a given period of time. We want to be able to make strong claims about the amount of information, uh, even in the presence of an adversary that is willing to engage in fingerprinting, navigational tracking, registering large number of domains and other attacks. So this is good. They're like, hey, what can we do to minimize the overall footprint of data being leaked out? Okay, so that is it is good. Our uh, utility goal is to support all the major aggregate conversion measurement use cases, um, view through, click through, return on ad spend, conversion lift, cross pl publisher attribution, including in cases where ad impressions and ad conversions happen in different browsers or devices. So now they're trying to figure out not just I'm on this one um, web browser, I have uh, privacy mode enabled, and it sees I did an internet search, I clicked on an ad on the internet search, I landed on the page, I purchased it. Um, in the current model with Google ads at least, I don't know how Facebook ads work, but in the current model with Google ads, I can do all that and I can see the actual real information for the person who bought the product. I can't necessarily see the information for the people who have clicked on the ad. Okay, but I can see if you've already gone all the way through the conversion method, I can see exactly who you are so I can match every one of those orders who actually clicked on the ad and, and saw it. I can't see the people who have just clicked on the ad without buying. But what they're trying to say is it doesn't matter if it's this browser, that browser, your computer, your phone, uh, some random place. If you've clicked through it, it can track you in any of those locations. So it's a way to track you even across devices. Sounds a little bit less 
private to me in that respect. That's their ultimate goal. Our competition goal is to ensure the utility cases listed above would function for all digital advertising players, um, which the end of the document is going to dispute that. Furthermore, we want to avoid designs that would create barriers for entry to new players. All right. So they talk about some major design choices or some acknowledgments here. Um, and then here is your basic components. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you guys. All right. So before, so the NPC, this is your, um, is a multi, there is, um, multi-party computation. So the idea of a multi-party computation is the information is going to collect a bunch of data but not actually process it until it receives enough information to process allegedly anonymously. But they are actually going to do um, this differential privacy element here in the end which basically means they're adding white noise. Uh, but they're giving you the white noise they're giving. So they're basically they're giving you one of the add-ins and the sum. Well if you know your basic math, take your sum Subtract one of your add-ins and you get your other add-in. Thought. Seems like a weakness to me. Okay, so before the multiplayer computation, it's going to set a match key. Now, what's important here is that the match key... Now, here is the, the biggest limitation to this as it currently is implemented is it requires you to log in. So if you're following our basic procedures that I always teach on this channel, never ever log into anything you don't need to log into. Have separate browsers, separate isolation channels to make sure that everything is just fine. Okay, but the, the match keys are generally static or they don't change a lot. That's part of their plan. So Facebook has a match key. Google has a match key. Microsoft has a match key. Why am I picking these sites? Because that's what's in their documentation. You'll see that a little bit later on. All right. Um, tells you all you need to know, right? Uh, I think that's only five sites they list are, uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, we'll see. But this, the match keys basically says this is the match key, which allows you to trace the same user, whether you're on their computer, whether you're on your phone, a tablet, a smart TV. If you're logged in, it knows that setting match key so it can track you across all these different devices. It can identify you as the same person. Now they're doing a source event generation and trigger event generation. So these are identifying individual keys as they are, you're clicking on a site, you're um, clicking on an image, you're uh, clicking the next, the next button, proceed further on down the cage. And then they're doing the uh, event uh, coalition model. Uh, they're doing some fraud protection here. And then once it collects enough data, then it transfers over to the MPC, which involves two separate helper servers. This is one of their weaknesses. They're kind of like Tor nodes. They can be compromised and made malicious. And in, in functioning with the client server, they can actually help to de-anonymize you if we're not careful. Now we have privacy budgeting, which is going to limit the number of queries that an individual entity can do so you can't run infinite amounts of queries to attempt to parse out the data on your own to figure out who is who but um, which is which is a beneficial thing. We have our matching, which is going to align everything together, attribution, and then the anti-poisoning and, and differential privacy is adding white noise. And then in generating the report, they're going to tell you what white noise they added. <laughs> Go figure. All right, so I'm setting the match keys. Um, so they basically have an interoperable API, such as every browser and mobile device used by a particular person is capable of generating a standardized ad impression or ad conversion reports, which is only joinable within a specific secure multi-party computation. Okay, so each individual device is going to have its key. All of those, though, tie into the site. And let's see, so it could be set by any app or websites, most usably by the people commonly logging in on multiple devices. They could even say that, hey, the match key might simply be your username for that service. All right. Um, the browser would add it to local private storing. <clears throat> so it's basically stored on your individual device there. Okay, so to achieve our privacy goals, it's critical that the match key is not readable. It should only be visible to the browser or the operating system. And they should probably add app in there as well because clearly they're talking about apps up here uh, as well. Anything that is 
accessing it. Because remember an app, when in the context of some of these applications, is nothing more than a browser container anyway. So an app, I would add an app to that app, um, the web browser, or the operating system. So that's kind of terrifying that your whole operating system can be spying on you like this. You think that Microsoft's going to push this in? Oh, you better believe it. Better switch to Linux. Value is only used for the purpose of generating reports that can be joined to the NPC. It's kind of like, there's too much language here. It's like, I mean, it's it's joining in with the NPC, man. <laughs> Not, however, high entropy or unguessable. For instance, it could be the user site-specific user ID. Match key would be consistent with across devices. Scoped to match the key provider. It's writable. It's not readable. Uh, limited in purpose. So it is consistent across devices is what tracks you to this individual um, identifier. So that's really what is going on here. Um, looking at the event generation, anything that they can do, which is basically that they even say in here, it could be any type of event. It doesn't even have to be an event that uh, that you interact with. Uh, simply loading up a page, simply loading a tracking pixel from a page, anything like that. Uh, and some of the things that it talks about in here is that you can uh, use this not only to show what ad was was uh, displayed, but also point out places where a an ad opportunity exists. Hey, it would be great if you put an ad right here in between these two clicks. So somebody clicks on this, views an ad, and then has to click further. Yeah, if you want people to turn off your website, maybe but you know trigger event would own the uh is an event which the participating websites and apps wish to measure in relation to source events so these are things that happen here is how the model works this is occurring inside of the mpc we have a bunch of clients are feeding uh the the various clients so this is your phone this is your computer this is your tablet all tying into a single consumer element this is feeding into the leader is the um main uh, coalition into the MPC. And then you have two helper servers, which are processing some of the data, kind of like a Tor node to keep things somewhat isolated. But if one of these guys becomes compromised and starts feeding back data into the consumer, you can be completely de-anonymized. And then the MPC is going to collect, uh, finally send out the data as a report. Uh, this one here is... Um, uh, other act uh, aggregate attribution measurement proposals have proposed joining source and trigger events on device. We propose joining the events within the MPC. This is a key innovator. There are a number of motivations. Number one, improve privacy. I don't know how it improves the privacy when it's multiple devices that you all contain all feed to the same place. But this is what they say anyway. When joined up data leaves a device, fingerprinting attacks can be used to reconstruct user level uh, cross-site data. Mitigations like adding random time delays, limiting entropy, and hiding IP addresses are only somewhat helpful, and mitigation attacks come at significant cost to ad buyer, buyers who rely on timely data. All right. Um, simplified fraud prevention on device matching introduces new challenges in fraud detection. Token-based schemes might improve the situation. Then cross-device on device attribution joins a source event and a trigger event on a single device almost entirely excludes joining them on different devices. By moving to join at the MPC instead, it's trivially easy to make cross-device API. All right, so this is saying that, hey, we need to figure out who this person is by joining everything together on the MPC, not on the device itself. Um, let's see, joining events with the protocol. Here's basically the same thing we saw before. They're just making it look secure with encrypted match keys. Here's your helper servers. These are what your helper servers are going to do. So we're going to decrypt the keys with a encrypted keys and a secret, and then we're going to add in blinding factors. This is where that white noise is added in. So they're adding in a little bit of white noise. They're adding in some other some other things. Basically, like, well, this guy looked at at football and baseball. We're gonna just for fun, we're gonna throw in basketball too. Um, and then we're gonna later on. It tells you that it's gonna tell us what was in there. So it says, but by the way, they the person likes football and baseball and basketball, but we told it to like basketball. <laughs> That's literally what it says it's doing down here at the bottom. Um, 
Differential privacy. Um, I think this is where it says it. Differential privacy is important. Let's see. Fortunately, amount of noise that must be added does not increase the number of events in the query. It means a larger number of batches uh, produces a better signal to noise ratio by providing the business with flexibility how they structure the queries so they can choose how much noise is in there or not. Um, Let's see, privacy budgeting. This is how you can limit, uh, basically prevent the the consumer, the ad, ad buyer from de-anonymizing people based on running hundreds and hundreds of reports. They basically have a certain number of ports they can gain, and the the more... Um, the more restrictive that they make those reports to try to de-anonymize people, the more it eats up their privacy budget. So you can do a lot of reports with a lot of noise, but fewer reports with little noise. There's privacy grain. Um, so this is talking about the... Um, uh, i got to remember this part. We need to decide the scope of which events... Uh, okay, the privacy grain is where is the uh, where is the tracking starting? Is it tracking at the website? Is it tracking at the business? We're going to talk about this a little bit further because that's one of the things I want to talk about. Uh, here is known threat models. So here's the various attacks. Um, if a secret share gets known, um, if a known event uh, cardinally, so... Uh, this is if you happen to have a way to track one particular person to a specific event, you can de-anonymize the whole group, despite how anonymous it's supposed to be. Um, known linear relationships. Here's anti-poisoning. Attention draws as much as possible to design a prio here to constrain set trigger values. Something reasonable, thereby prevent malicious entity from corrupting measurements with a single malicious input. So they're basically trying to uh, make sure that things only come out in individual groups. Uh, okay, so here is where I talked about earlier. Here's your match keys. Our approach is to have each site slash app specifically uh, specify a fixed list of acceptable match keys. Facebook, Google, Reddit, Twitter, Microsoft. Yeah, all, all companies that we should all be trusting every single day. Um, when the browser or OS generates a source or trigger event, this list could be passed on as an argument and all available match keys could be included. So, hey, we're going to give you a list of a bunch of match keys, but guess what? This one matched. Yay! So the source event and the trigger event match. Uh, no match over here because, you know, these are all tied to the same uh, same company. All right. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the part down here where it sounded a little conspiratorial, but where we're kind of getting into things. Unless, I don't know, maybe, maybe they changed it since I read it. I only read it like an hour ago, and then it changed before I right before I started recording the video. All right, so the API proposal entities will be running queries, sending batches of the event to the MPC consortium for process. This will cost money as such. We envision a system by which entities must register, supply payment instrument, and are provided with credentials at the time of registration. Entities... Yeah, they definitely changed that. Um, no, no, it's done here. This is the part. I'm sorry. Uh, 643, moving to privacy grain to business. Considering source queries, if we manage the privacy budget of the grain of the IPA registered business and then the user instead of the site and then the user, we would address the risk of entities using multiple sites to exceed their per user privacy budget. We'd also promote more equal competition by ensuring that all ad vendors have an equal privacy budget regardless of how many websites are part of their network. All right, so we would need to add various checks to the registration process to prevent ad tech vendors from registering large amounts of colluding entities. This seems more traceable than limiting the number of sites. Intuitively, the total number of ad tech companies that serve ads or websites shouldn't be too large. That is a globalist agenda thing. We have to limit the number of companies feeding this data. Managing a limited number of independent privacy budgets is attractive from a privacy perspective. Hmm. All right. Um, number of ad buyers is expected to be large, which means that each ad buyer has to go through a limited number of vendors. Really, how many ad vendors are there? Outside of Facebook and Google, do you really have a lot of other viable choices for ads? This is a good question. If anybody knows the answer to that too, by the way, let me know. Um, I've not looked into it. So here's my final thoughts. I, I, I throw down four lists here on my little sticky note. Um, number one, all, um, all of this is on the app side. I use app for operating system, website, application, whatever you're doing, which 
minimizes the user's ability to opt out. I mean, sure, you might have an option there to, uh, you know, just go ahead and, uh, you know, click the button to opt out. But how do we really know we're being opted out? How do we really know? Because they can still be collecting all the data. We don't know at all. Whereas if you're using a system like cookies, like we currently have, I can explicitly set my browser to not accept cookies, to delete cookies every single time, to not be logged in, not store any of this data. So this is a move away from user control and toward the pro interest of business. And that's always a problematic thing. The helper servers are vulnerable. This is like Tor nodes. Uh, you better believe that those helper servers, they are going to be breached and they're going to leak data. And since we have no way to, to opt out, we're simply going to be tracking across the web. All right. Um, and then we, yeah, okay. I'm going to leave that word out again. Just uh, already, already poked that bear a little bit. All right. The last one is, um, here's the only real positive about this. It generally assumes you're logged into the services. Now, this doesn't mean you're logged into the services on the website you're interacting with. This means your browser's logged into Facebook. As long as your browser's logged into Facebook, you are part of this. This is just like Flock. Now, Mozilla has been critical of Flock, but it is very similar to Flock in that respect. It is doing a very similar thing. It's just now it's, hey, it's Mozilla and Facebook timing up of all people. This is yet another nail in the coffin of Mozilla. What in the world are those people doing over there? Can somebody just buy Firefox out from them so that we have a good browser without being tied to all this crap? And for the love, no, do not put APIs in there that's going to allow people to track individual users across the Internet in a way that they don't have any specific user control over. I guess maybe in Firefox, the advantage is we, in theory, will be able to completely disable the API. That's a benefit. Uh, websites took a stand against Flock to the point where Google is shutting that down. They're probably going for something worse. Uh, Joomla, actually, the, the new version of Joomla out, Joomla 4, came out recently. That explicitly blocked Flock. I would be not be surprised if it would explicitly block this service as well. It behaves very similar. Um, and so this is dangerous. Uh, a little longer video than I have been doing lately, but uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed what is behind the Meta and Facebook partnership. Go ahead and have a look. I've listed the links to the um, GitHub and the Google Doc down below. So if you would like to read it for yourself, go ahead and enjoy that. Thanks for coming along, everybody. And I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.